but the uh the dream I had was <clears throat> damn it. <laughs> you got me, man. Mm. The dream I had uh was I was talking to him, right? And uh he was showing me his new apartment. Thank you for having me, man. It's Thank so you. cool. This is, uh, this is so wonderful to finally be on your show. Um, this is the first time you've been at this studio. Yeah, that's right. Have I been on your show before? Yeah. On the uh, phone, but not in studio. A live, I don't a think live one studio. at the Ice House, not in studio. Really? Oh, a live one at the Ice House. The night that you sent us when we did the acid, <laughs> and you sent us the video of that's the, right. the transgender guy. Yeah. With Harry, you couldn't tell whether well, he had a pussy. I don't think dick. he was transgender. I don't know what he was. He, he just started, had a small penis. He started singing, dancing. <laughs> he was Mexican just dancing. Music. I yeah. sent that to everybody. <laughs> on acid that night. I, I remember it was a great joy to hear you laughing and knowing oh that God. I had sent that to you. It was awesome. And the only person who got pissed at me to send it to him was Rogan. And really? I got tons of Christians on there. Rogan was like, what the fuck is that, man? <laughs> How you doing? I'm good, man. I'm doing good. Congratulations on fatherhood. Thank you. I mean, uh, when I had my child, you were the first one at the hospital with a camera. Yeah. We went to breakfast. That's right. We spoke about the future, and here we are six years later, and the seats are reversed. Unbelievable. What do you think? When was the child born? Uh, the third. It just, what do you think? So it's the best. 25 days into fatherhood. Yeah. And what are you thinking so far? Uh, it's, well, it's like I have had more experience with death than birth. So, because I've, I've watched both my parents die, and what's wild about it is it reminds me of this thing i heard opposite stand back to back and so there's all these similarities in birth and death that are it's the complete opposite so in death you've got the hospice worker who comes in birth you have the midwife in death when people are dying they like something else enters the room like it's amazing it's beautiful it's calming it's the opposite of what you might think it would be it's like it, it reminds you of something. It's that sense of like, you know, when you can almost remember a song, but you can't remember it. But it's it's like, what is this? This is some, I know what this is, but it's surreal, you know? It's like, uh, there's a thing. Have you ever heard of a fey light? You ever heard of fey light? No. So when someone's dying, they have a kind of light around them sometimes. I had this guy on who does, who studies uh, death people who come back, who like were brain dead or their heart stopped. And it's a fascinating phenomenon because all over the planet they all report the same fucking thing. But I was, I had them on. What the do they say when they come back? So it goes, it's like you, you the light thing, you see a light, uh, you see yourself, your body, but you look different than the way you look in a mirror because you're seeing yourself for the first time. Because when you look at yourself in the mirror, you're just seeing yourself a reflection. But in this way, you're like, you, you, you look different apparently than you thought you looked. And then, uh, I guess, like hearing your voice for the first time on a tape recorder. And then also, you the the what's called the life review happens, which is uh, you sort of uh, we think of it in the movies. They usually show it like you're like watching a TV or something, and it's like you know you're wa like Scrooge or some shit watching what you did. But it, there's more of a sense of not just watching it, but feeling the way you made everyone around you feel. And so you feel the way you made the people around you feel. And there's some justice in there and some sadness in there and some, you know, love in there and joy in there. And you just feel how you impacted the world while you were there. And then, um, then a, like universally, this is around the planet, they report this, a fucking like monkey comes running out of the darkness and fucks your mouth for like 10 minutes. And then that's usually you wake back up in your body. But the monkey thing, they don't talk about a lot. It's really fucking weird. <laughs> but that's universal. That would ruin it for me. Like I, <laughs> that would fucking ruin it for me. Like I just Getting saw my life. By a monkey? I just remembered all the highlights of my life that I yearned to see. Yeah. There was a movie that was released in the 70s called Beyond and Back. And I've never been able to find it. Uh, and it was in the movie theaters. I paid to go see it about people who had death experiences, came back and reported what they saw. Yeah. Uh, I was involved in something when I was a kid where I wasn't in the room, but I was tight with the brother and the mom and the whole family. She had a brain tumor. And that night she went into a coma or something like that. In the middle of the night she 
snapped out of the coma and said, open the window. My grandfather wants me to go. She was tight with her uh -huh. grandfather. And they were like, what are you saying? And she's like, just open the window. My grandpa wants me to go. Blah, 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 blah. And then she ended up living. She doesn't remember. I asked her years later. We had grown up together, and I go, what, when you went under, where did you go? And she goes, it was just warm. Yeah. She goes, I just felt warm. So I've always believed, you were saying that with across the street from a funeral park. That's right. And I was like, I've always lived close to something to do with a funeral. I've always had death around me, and it's very sad. Mm. But it's... It's time to go. <laughs> oh Jesus! That was a real <laughs> was like that. It's uh, the energy is, it's very, it's a uh, certain places have tendencies. That's a good way to put it. You know, just like certain people have tendencies, certain places have tendencies. You know, repeating patterns. So that one of the tendencies of the comedy store is it tends to create really great fucking comics. That's one of its tendencies. You know, it gives birth, spits out these comedians every once in a while that like become very successful and um it has other tendencies too right and uh we know about the other tendencies that it has too so uh the energy there is very powerful and real and uh if you are very if you're even if you don't the worst thing is to not know you're sensitive to just think you're normal oh man you are fucked if you go to that place because it'll start fucking with you a little bit. And which is why all these like people who have a variety of mental illnesses would show up there throughout the years. You know, it almost would draw them to it. But I'll tell you, man, a ghost experience, two ghost experiences that I had there. One, we would have clairvoyants come in there every once in a while, like once a year, a clairvoyant would come in and want to like try to communicate with the spirit of the place because it's a legendary haunted place. And so... This clairvoyant comes and they're like, "Do you, can we just walk through the building? I just wanna see if I can communicate with the spirits here. And so we're walking through the building and they're, you know, they're doing the usual clairvoyant shit, which I'm pretty skeptical about, you know, cause it's like, if you name a certain number of names, you're gonna hit something. So the name stuff that they do, I don't know. I don't usually pay attention to it, you know, like I'm sensing a William Brothers brothers some kind of brothers there was a thin nah, 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 nah. and also it's a researchable building so it's like anything you say is not gonna make me feel like it's proof of something if you're in a historic building but you know that's the steps going up to the belly room yes and there's like a sign at the bottom of the steps there uh i think it's neon it definitely has lights i don't know what inside or outside so out inside the, right. you make the right turn you go up right. the steps the and there's stand. the there at there's least a it's, sign there's, there's a neon sign right there. okay so they go by that she goes by that sign and stops if you got the syringe take a chance and starts being like oh there's a there it's it's a it's a, that's when she's saying it's brothers there's a, some kind of so someone there's something happened she's like do it straight out of poltergeist shit and that was pretty weird but you know pretty good act and then that fucking sign, man, it starts going. Zzz, 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 zzz. It's reacting to her. I'd never seen that sign do that. That I saw it with my own fucking eyes. Now what that was, I have no idea, but it creeped me out. The other uh, thing I saw there was uh, really interesting. And I think, you know, when, when people talk about the ghost of the comedy store, they're thinking like Casper, something with a sheet over its head or some kind of like, you know, stereotypical ghost concept. Um, but if you think about it more in terms of like an energetic, there's an energetic form there that repeats itself, this will make more sense. And that's what the ghost is. But I was like, I was looking down the hallway at the belly room and I was just watching some comics and some dumb fight, you know, just fighting you motherfucker. They were like in a, I don't know, I don't know the comics where they were like someone in a belly room show, but they were in a pretty intense fight. And I was just watching it. I couldn't hear them. They left, right? And then within like three minutes in that very same spot, two different people got in the same fucking fight. Same movement, same like da 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 da. I'm sitting there watching like an echo of the same fucking thing I just saw with two different people. Uh, now, assuming that this wasn't some conspiracy where some weird goddamn 
freakish improv on the spot. People were trying to fuck with some solitary belly room comedian sitting on the couch. Then that indicates to me that there was like a kind of eddy, like a ripple that was happening there, like a little fucking energetic ripple that people who weren't protected or who weren't, who were a little too reactive when they were getting in it, they were acting like it. And then, you know, trying to make sense of it later. You fucked her at the pool? No, dog. I got manners. I'm a Catholic. I mean, this is that Mark Twain quote. Religion started when the first con man met the first fool. It's like, if you ever find yourself in a situation where somebody is pitching something, some astounding thing to you, and it doesn't match your instincts, but you decide to like go with them, even though you can feel this isn't right. In that moment, you become sadly complicit in this form of exploitation. You didn't listen to your heart, you listened to the charismatic person, and you got pulled in a little bit. And you know, usually the way this shit works is, uh, there's a name, I can't remember the name. Once you've invested a certain amount of money or time in a thing, it gets more and more difficult to leave. Not because it's difficult to leave, because you're stuck based in this fallacy of the amount of dough you've poured into the fucking thing. So you're like, I just gotta stay, you know, this is it. This is like that crazy shit that you read about Scientology, you know, which is like at the very, like the one of the highest levels, they show you a briefcase that has written on it, over on Hubbard's handwriting, which has got, you know, the whole like Xenu stuff, basically, stuff that just seems completely antithetical to your complete understanding of reality. And at that moment, you've put in a lot of dough and you either go, oh, wow, oh shit, this is kind of embarrassing. Or you're like, well, it must be true. It must be true like the other stuff. It must be true. And you keep going, right? That ignorance is what that's called. And some people exploit other people's ignorance. They're blind spots. A great magician, like a stage magician, what does he do? He knows the shit you can't see. He knows how to distract you and do all this shit. And then like while he's doing that, he like makes apparent magic happen. And it's cool. But you know it's not real. Like we always do about this time. <laughs> yeah. But it doesn't stop with magic. You know, it's it, it like keeps going. So there's people who understand that human beings, when I said most people don't know themselves, what I meant is humans... If you're raised in an alcoholic family, you're taught to ignore that daddy's a fucking drunk, an angry drunk, or that mommy's an angry drunk. You're taught to ignore that, you know? Or if you're even worse, you're in a fucking family where there's sexual abuse, you know? And, and you know if, I'm, if I talk about this, I'm gonna destroy the family, and you will destroy the family. So it's easier to forget it, or it's easier to pretend it didn't happen, or it's easier to try to make sense of it in your own fucking head. And it's a really sad thing that many of us have experienced and have done, right? And and that is the most sad thing, which is why I love that quote in the Bible when Jesus is talking about, you know, suffer the little children to come unto me. If anyone should harm one of these, it would be better that a millstone were tied to their neck and they were thrown into the sea. And I think in this case, what Christ is saying is not just about children, certainly about children, but also about the other children out there who have adult bodies, but who have no fucking idea uh, who they are, what they are. They've been taught to ignore from the moment they were born, or even worse, to make sense of the fact that their fucking dad's punching their mom in the fucking face, right? Or even worse, to imagine it's their fault. Because, you know, it's easier to imagine it's your fault if someone's hurting you, because then you can pretend you have a little bit of control than to just realize you're being victimized, right? So there are predatory humans in the world who will prey upon that quality in others will. and will and will use it. And will and there's various levels of it. Me, me, come welcome to LA. Open up that door a little sure. bit for me. Just to get some air in here. Thank you. Welcome to LA. Yeah, look welcome. at that fucking what's that off that hilarious joke Chappelle has about like the pent bath, you know? Like the the joke about how like uh, something about like a pimp will like beat up a prostitute you know and then give her a bath 
And she falls in love with him because he's giving her the bath, forgetting about the fucking abuse that just happened, right? Like that model of exploitation of human beings is unfortunately, like any other thing in the world, it has evolved and become refined. And what's really sad about it is there's a fuck ton of people out, out there who haven't even thought about the fact that maybe they're being tricked by someone. You know, it's not, fuck the, the, the you know, at least when you're in a compound and you're looking over and Jim Jones is mouth fucking your wife while somebody in the back is stirring a vat of fucking cyanide and Kool-Aid. At least in that moment, you like have, you like it's, at least it's something you, like you smoking need. smoking wax, you wanna see the motherfucking devil? You know when you dream sometimes about someone who's passed and it's more than a dream. It's just not a dream. It feels like you're there with them. They came to visit you. Yes. So <clears throat> my dad, he um, he lived in apartments most of his life, you know, and um, my dad l loved life. That's why I loved you. And that's why you two connected because you both have this, just you love life. You love life. And it's it's just, it's such a wonderful thing because whether you're doing great whether things are down, you love life. We're alive. Yeah. We're yeah. alive. What do you mean you lost a foot? Yeah. You're alive. You can still eat pussy. Yeah. What are you you're looking at the so what? You can't walk to the store. You got a roller skate. You know what I'm saying? But you That's can still right. eat pussy. There's yeah. always a fucking bright side. I'm sorry to interrupt. That's it, though, man. And that relationship with life is very romantic. And it's wonderful. And it helps everybody around you. And after he passed, you know, I was talking to people who, like, he was always giving gifts to people. I went down to the like, uh, to like talk to the people at his apartment, you know, about like getting the place clean and everything. And they were talking about how like at Thanksgiving, he'd bring him a turkey and stuff. He was always giving, 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 giving. He was very, but secretly, he never talked about this shit, no, man. you don't need to. And he like, he was in Vietnam and he had, he had, you know, he like had a lot of like medals that we found after he passed never fucking talked about it man never talked what kind about of medals? It. dude like i had someone go through it i don't want to say it here because i I just i'm afraid like i don't want to like insult anyone in the military by accidentally saying my dad had achieved this or that but they're really intense ones man and they were just in a drawer you know they're just in a drawer he went to vietnam he was in vietnam he went and he went for two tours and he went you know he volunteered to go back for the second one <clears throat> but the uh the dream I had was, <clears throat> damn it, <laughs> you got me, man. Mm. The dream I had uh, was, I was talking to him, right? And uh, he was showing me his new apartment. And he, was, he liked it, because it was right on the ocean. It had an ocean view. And um, he was like, super proud of it. He would have loved that in real life. And he loved it uh, in the dream. And, uh, and he said, yeah, but I've got these neighbors upstairs. And uh, he's like, they seem like they're your friends. Uh, they seem like they're aliens or something. I don't really know who they are. And then, like, I looked up in the dream. And there's, like, these two Buddhist monks in robes that are, like, standing behind it. And uh, it was cool, man. It was like a feeling of, like, okay, just maybe. Maybe, just maybe, because like when I was when he was passing, I was teaching him some mantras. You know, I was teaching him, Om Mani Padme Hum, Om Mani. Behold the Behold the Jewel in the Heart of Lotus, and I. He was chanting it a little bit, and as he was passing, he got real. Um, you know, he got real. That's what happens when people are dying; they get real. And we had some great conversations about death, and what was going to happen, and what I'd heard, and what it is. And so I don't know. It was a really beautiful dream. And it made me, it gave me some hope that uh, whatever happens after that, uh, maybe some people came and like guided him through that process, you know, who uh, were maybe uh, part of the uh, Buddhist Sangha, the Dharma, as they call it. And I don't know, it was just a dream, you know, but I do know this. He died in a really sweet way. He died in a really sweet way, man. And uh, that says a lot about a person. A per and uh, yeah, and he loved you. Yes. One door closed and another one opened. That's, That's right. Up. And now you get to relive your dad through him. He's got his, you know what's cool? He looks like my mom and he's got my dad's dimple 
and he's got my dad's hair. So it's the most beautiful thing. I mean, I don't mean it's just so wonderful. Oh, wow, I, I, listen, I I'm, I know when I talk to you on the phone, you're a new person. Yes, yeah, you're a new for person. sure. And for everything that you've gone through, this child has cleansed it all away. 